It's time for Agriculture, presented by Tricana Farms in Germantown, New York, a small-scale producer of heritage breed livestock and a wide array of vegetables and berries on just over 39 acres. They also produce a full array of garden vegetables, many of them heirloom varieties raised naturally, as well as an assortment of berries, including raspberries, blackberries, gooseberries, black, red, and white currants, mulberries, and elderberries. And now, here's Mark Scherzer. This weekend, many people will, at various truncated Zoom seders and gatherings diminished to COVID-safe numbers, tell the story of the exodus of the Hebrews from Egypt. The emphasis of the Passover story, as we tell it at the seder table, is of the liberation of the Jews from slavery, and they're finding a land where they could determine their own future. The theme I always liked best is the idea that in each generation, a new freedom is won, a new form of liberation is recognized. While the story in the Haggadah, the book we read from at the Seder, emphasizes the political social dimensions and the deal the Jews made with God for their deliverance, it's hard for me still in the thick of lambing season not to think of just how much of the Passover narrative involves sheep. It's not just the Paschal lamb, which God decreed should come from killing a lamb without blemish, smearing its blood on the doorposts, and then cooking it for a feast in a very specific way. Eat not of it raw, not sodden at all with water, but roasted with fire. No, as befits what was a pastoral society, in many ways sheep drive the entire dynamic of the story. Joseph led his clan down to Egypt in the first place, at Pharaoh's invitation, because there was not enough pasture for their flocks in their home territory. Once in Egypt, the Israelites' flocks were fruitful and multiplied. Fear of the Israelites' economic success, and presumably concern about how their flocks sucked up scarce resources, led the Egyptians to quash the economic threat by subjugating this pastoral people into slave labor, building cities. When Moses, who had discovered his identity as one of them and began to try to protect his people, had to flee Egypt, he met the seven daughters of the priest of Midian by chasing away the shepherds who were preventing them from watering their sheep. The grateful priest of Midian gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses as a mate. Moses became part of the household and the shepherd of the priest's flock. Had he not been a shepherd, he would never have encountered the burning bush because he did that while wandering far afield, pasturing those sheep. When after the ten plagues, Pharaoh ultimately relented and let my people go, they left Egypt with a, quote, mixed multitude, including their flocks and herds. By then, you can see Moses as the metaphorical shepherd of an unruly flock of Israelites as they wandered into the desert searching for forage. Manna was supplied until they reached the land of milk and honey, a poetic way of saying a fertile place with pasture. Sheep, both actual and metaphorical, are simply everywhere in the biblical narrative. I can relate. With 24 births in the last month, the phrase to be fruitful and multiply haunts my mind. There have been some stillbirths and lambs that didn't make it, but far outweighing those sad moments have been the moments of life affirmed. 13-year-old Nilifer, the oldest sheep on the premises, had a huge healthy ram lamb. Scrawny number 45 had lovely twins whom Eric named Binet and Finet. You number 300, known around here as Skunkface, had stillborn twins last week, but her Hormonally driven desire for motherhood is still so strongly coursing through her that when another ewe lambed Thursday, she showed up to help the mother lick the lamb clean. Best of all so far has been Sophie, who was only with us because Troy and Victoria and their visiting friends so assiduously rescued her, nursed her back from the brink of death when she was born in the cold of early March 2019. Sophie is affectionate to the human she recognizes because she was bottle fed. She had a lamb last week named Chloe now, with most unusual and adorable coloring, and I hope she's going to be equally affectionate to us. As it apparently was for the ancient Israelites, sheep multiplication is not an unmitigated blessing. In my case, the issue is not competition for resources with the Egyptians, but my desire as an old geezer to conserve my own resources and to farm at a smaller scale. No surprise that in my case, one antidote for for multiplication turns out to be division. Two weeks ago, I sold a ewe with twin lambs and another very pregnant ewe who has since lambed to a well-known purveyor of fine foods who wants to establish a herd of caracals for a cheese operation in Orange County. Today, I sold my remaining ram, Rumi, six ewes and their six lambs to a farm in Vermont that has brought sheep from us before but has no ewes younger than eight years old and needs an infusion of young blood. They took with them another ewe and her twin lambs, destined for another farm in Vermont, 
which wants to establish a fiber operation. With my single herd essentially divided into four, only one of which I'm retaining, I've taken a step toward my goal of shrinking the herd. But there are still 24 sheep out there in my field with a couple of pregnancies yet to come to term, should any of you want to contemplate starting your own caracal herds. Of course, at the end of this year, I will send off four or five of this year's lambs to slaughter. While I look forward to replenishing our frozen lamb inventory for my eating as well as for sale, I find it far more edifying to be selling ewes as breeding stock, knowing that they will go forth to green lands where they'll be cared for well, and, like the Israelites' flocks, will undoubtedly be fruitful and multiply. Agriculture is underwritten by Chicana Farms, LLC, a small-scale producer of heritage-bred livestock and a wide array of vegetables and berries on just over 39 acres in Germantown, New York. More information, 518-537-3815.